you have your Bible, turn with me today to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So uh, some of you are new to HCC and you might not know, so my wife Vicki always sits down on the front row. Vicki, can you kind of wave to everybody and let them know who you are? So she sits down on the front row down there. So um, I don't know how well that you know Vicki and me, but the more you get to know us, the more you realize how different we are. Lots of times, uh, especially we're talking about marriage, and you think, man, in order for us to have a successful marriage, we got to think alike, we got to be alike, we got to do things alike, and Vicki and I are the opposite of that. So at times, I think we couldn't be any more different. For example, she's a farm girl. She, she, she was raised on a farm, animals and tractors and feeding the chickens. And I remember one of the first times I went over to their house, hope she don't mind to say that they had this baby lamb and they actually allowed the baby lamb to come in the house. Her mom allowed, uh, her mom allowed the baby lamb to come in. And I don't want you to think we had animals roaming through the house. That was the only time that ever happened. So Vicky's a farm girl, but I'm a city boy. Man, I like all the conveniences of the city and uh, we can talk about that all day long as a result of that she loves to be outside so she will be outside as much as she possibly can I prefer to be inside uh, can I get an amen on that God made air conditioning for a reason he didn't make air conditioning so that we would spend all the time outside in the hot air but she prefers to be outside I prefer to be inside her, uh, her favorite food is pizza my favorite food are hamburgers, and so you can see whenever we decide where we're going to go that there's this conflict that takes place. She likes her cookies hard, and I like soft cookies, all right? There's just something about me that I just want, I want it to be as doughy and as chewy as it possibly can, but, but, but she likes to like, like crispy, the crispier, the better. I just don't get that. She, she loves Hallmark movies, especially Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> oh, man. I think once you've seen one, you've seen all of them, all right? Because they're exactly the same. All they do is change the characters, but it's the exact same plot line. And so she'll say, Brian, come in here and sit down and watch TV with me. What are you going to watch? A Hallmark movie. And and I, I, I usually get an emergency phone call from somebody that I just got to minister to. Vicki loves physical labor. So if you know anything about us, we have one toolbox, we have one tool belt at our house. They both belong to Vicki, all right? She loves physical labor, and I avoid physical labor at all costs, all right? You, you can make fun of me and say that I have soft hands. Doesn't bother me a bit. I just don't enjoy physical labor. So lots of times, Vicki is here at the church talking with Mark Metcalf and people that build things, and they're talking about all of that stuff. That's just not me, all right? Now, you might sit back from a completely external perspective, and you might think, oh, my word, there's no way that marriage is going to work. I mean, I mean, there are way too many differences between Brian and Vicki. Well, as many of you know, last year we celebrated 35 years of marriage. And this next year we celebrate 36 years of marriage. That doesn't mean that we don't have our challenges. All right, we still have our challenges, just as Jonas said when he threw me under the bus just a few moments ago. Uh, we still have our challenges. We still have to make compromises at times. I will say this, though, I will not compromise on cookies, all right? They've got to be soft cookies, all right? They cannot be hard cookies. What I'm saying simply is this, that our diversity as a couple has not weakened us. Our diversity as a couple has strengthened us. It has not divided us, even though there are times that she eats pizza and I eat hamburgs, all right? There, there are times that that happens, but it hasn't divided us, it's united us. And we see that same truth applied in Scripture. The diversity of a church is not a weakness. The diversity of a church is a strength. If we were all the same, we would be a weak church. Could you imagine if everybody walked in on Sunday morning and all of us looked like Jonas Maldonado? 
Now, Rachel might like that, all right, but, but not all of us would. Or, or if all of us had the exact same talent. So if everybody here wanted to sing, and on Sunday morning we had 400 people up here on the platform singing on the praise team and nobody out in front of us. Diversity doesn't weaken us. Diversity strengthens us. And actually, diversity unites us. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so if you have your Bibles, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you have, follow along with me. We'll put the verses up on the screen in just a moment. Let me say this before we read, though, that we're we're in the middle of a four-week series that we're simply titling, I Love the Church. And we're talking about what is the church. Last week we saw that the church was not a building. The church was not a denomination. The church was not a program. But the church is the people of God. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And at this moment, Christ's church is meeting not only here on the corner of 441 and Taft, but Christ's church is meeting all over Hollywood. It's meeting all over the world as the body of Christ, the people of God, come together and worship him and so we see that beautifully illustrated in this chapter that we want to read and study today so would you would you pray with me as we begin today father thank you so much for the truths about which we have just sang thank you that we are not our own we've been bought we've been purchased by the precious blood of jesus christ And today we worship him, realizing that he is the only one here who is worthy of our worship. We recognize his presence, your presence, with us today. Now, Lord, I I ask that the Holy Spirit of God this morning would open our hearts. Lord, for some of us, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. Help us not to kind of tune out and tune off as if, We've already heard this before, but help us to realize that your word is alive. and We pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take your word and drive the truth home, the truths home, to our minds and to our hearts today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll start in verse 12. We're going to read the majority of the chapter, but follow along. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, For just as the body is one... And has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Throughout this chapter, the Apostle Paul shows that the church is similar in function to the human body. Uh, You would agree with me that the human body is far more complex. I think it's probably God's most amazing creation. It is, it is marvelously complex, yet at the same time marvi- marvelously unified. Let me just give you a couple examples. You, you probably remember this from high school anatomy, but your body and mine has 206 different bones in it. An adult body, unless you've lost one or broken one or had one amputated, your body and mine has 206 different bones. There are 650 different skeletal muscles in our body, muscles that are connected to our bones, and all of them work in unison and in tandem. They tell us that there are about 60,000 miles of arteries, veins, and capillaries in our body. Imagine that, 60,000 miles of arteries, veins, and capillaries. The adult brain has some 100 billion cells. As I read that, I realized some people have a little less. You know what I'm talking about? And some people have a little more, all right? But the brain is incredibly complex. 100 billion cells. Each kidney contains 1 million individual filters. And those filters filter an average of 2.2 pints of blood per minute. So every minute your body is filtering some 2.2 pints of blood, and they expel some 2.5 pints of urine a day. Just the focusing muscles in your eyes, if we just could pull out the eye, the focusing muscles on the eyes move around 100,000 times a day. 
Your eye actually works out more than any other part of your body. Doctors tell us that if your legs did the workout that your eyes do, you would walk more than 50 miles a day. I say that because it, it, it takes unbelievable cooperation for all those different parts of your body and mind to work together. They say that just to take one step requires 200 different muscles in your body to work. Imagine just me walking across the platform, the cooperation that is needed in my body. As you watch that, aren't you absolutely amazed at how my body works together? I know some of you look at my body and you're absolutely amazed, right? I mean, I mean just to stand on one foot alone, could you imagine? I mean, the coordination. Yeah, somebody clap for that, please, before I, before I fall, all right? Or imagine if I was going to do a backwards flip. I'm not going to do it right now. But imagine if I was going to do a backwards flip. The cooperation that would be needed from all the different parts of my body. Our body's absolutely amazing. It's no wonder the psalmist cried out in Psalm 139, I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. But, but here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's not giving us an anatomy lesson. I mean, even though all of that's amazing, that's not the purpose of what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. So, so what is Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? And his point very simply is this, if you have your outline in front of you, it's this. As believers, we are all united in one body. As believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are all united in one body. Now, catch this, because this is so very important. What Paul is stressing here is not individuality. Paul is not calling out one muscle or one bone or, or one organ or one part of the body and say, wow, look at that part of the body. He's not stressing individuality. What the Apostle Paul is stressing is unity in the passage. And, and here's what he's saying. Just as the body is perfectly united, so the body of Christ must be perfectly united. Just as all the different muscles need to work in tandem for us to operate efficiently as a body, so the body of Christ must all work in tandem for it to efficiently be and become and do what God has intended for us to do. You see, a, di a divided body cannot operate efficiently. Each part of the body must be united in purpose. Imagine, uh, imagine if all of a sudden uh, I started to turn this way and my right foot wanted to go this way, but my left foot said, no, we're going this way. And there's, I mean, just a stupid illustration, but there was just the struggle going on between my right side and my left side. I couldn't function. I couldn't go anywhere. And so the body must be united in purpose. It must be united in mission. It must be united in function. That's the way God intends for us to be. How it must grieve the heart of God to see his church divided. Let, let that sink into your mind and heart for just a moment. How it must grieve his heart when God created us for the purpose of being united, when God created us for the purpose of working in tandem. Does that mean we're perfect? Absolutely not. But he created, for, he created us to operate that way, and it grieves his heart when the church doesn't operate that way. It must grieve his heart to see believers at, at odds with one another, angry with one another, bitter and uncooperative. That never happens in the church, does it? Sadly, it does occasionally. Man, can I cut straight to the point for just a moment here today? Is there anyone in our body with whom you can't lock arms? Is there anyone in our body with whom you are ticked off? Maybe they offended you. Maybe they spoke incorrectly to you. Maybe they hurt you. Maybe they mistreated you. I get that. That happens. 
we're not perfect. We talked about last week that there is no such thing as a perfect church. And, and, and if, if there was a perfect church, don't join it or I shouldn't join it because we're going to run it. Why? We are a congregation of imperfect people. And imperfect people hurt each other. But catch this, church, for the sake of the body, for the sake of the church, for the sake of the mission, if there's anyone with whom you feel that way today that you've just quit talking to, you, you just prefer not to have any relationship with them whatsoever for the sake of the body, would you restore that relationship with your brother and sister in Christ? Yeah, but Brian, I don't want them to hurt me again. I'm never going to put myself in a position where, where they can hurt me again. Man, man, you cannot be around people and you cannot minister to people and you cannot have relationships with people unless you expose yourself to being hurt. The body of Christ is more important than our hurts and our offenses and our broken relationships. Here's what Paul is saying. Just as the body is perfectly united, so the body of Christ is must be perfectly united. There's a second truth that I want you to see, and i got to confess, I really didn't see that until this week. I've preached on this passage many times, but, but I want you to catch this. If you're following your outline, it's this. Each church is the body of Christ. So, so last week we talked about the big C church, universal, and we talked about the little C church, the local church. And if we're not careful, uh, it, we can put all of our emphasis on the big C church, and I'm all for the big C church. We talk about Church United and how we're partnering together with other churches. But Paul shows here in the passage that not only is the big C church the body of Christ, but the little C church is his complete body. Would you jump with me to verse 27, and we'll come back. Verse 27 of this chapter, Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says this, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. The, the, the you in verse 27 is addressed specifically to the Corinthian believers. Now, we believe that the Word of God transcends time, and just as, just as this message spoke to the Corinthians, it speaks to us today. But if we talk about who were the recipients to whom the Apostle Paul was writing this letter, he was writing this letter to the church of Corinth. And he tells that local assembly of believers, here's what he says, you are the body of Christ. He doesn't look at him and say, you're a small part of the body of Christ. He doesn't look at him and say, man, you're just a, an, an organ or a hand or whatever. He looks at them and he says, you are the body of Christ. Here's what Paul is saying, and don't lose the significance of this. Paul is saying that Hollywood Community Church is the body of Christ. But so is Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. That's the body of Christ. And so is Holy City Church that meets right over here on 66th Avenue. And so is the Answer Church, pastored by my friend Larry, that meets on 24th Avenue. And so is New City Fellowship that's on Van Buren Street. Each of those congregations are the body of Christ. You see, what Paul is doing here is he's placing emphasis not on the big C church, but he's placing emphasis on the little C church. And here's what he's saying, every local assembly is his body. That's why we're so confident in what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. He says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, what does he say? There I am in the midst of them. I was with one of our, our men yesterday and we were going through Kent Hughes' book on on worship, Edwin and I, and, and uh, this pastor talked about this experience that he had, and he was reminded of the fact that each and every Sunday, Jesus was present when they met together. Let the truth of that sink into, you, into your mind and heart today. We are not only worshiping Jesus today, we are worshiping with Jesus today. Catch that. We're not only worshiping Jesus, 
we're worshiping with him today. He is here present with us this, this morning. Brad alluded to that in his prayer just a few moments ago. What is Paul showing? Paul is showing that Jesus recognizes every assembly of believers as his living, breathing body. And there's so much truth that's incorporated in that, but it's this, that God has given Hollywood Community Church everything we need as the body of Christ to fulfill his mission here in Hollywood. It's not like he's sitting back and saying, okay, man, so I've given you guys a head and you got a couple of shoulders. You got one arm, but you don't have the other arm. Man, I wish that you guys could function, so you got to join together with this church over here because you got the left arm and they got the right arm, and we have to sit back and figure out, okay, we're a left arm church. Where's a right arm church that we can function with? Now, Paul is saying, us here today, we are completely the body of Christ. God has given us everything we need in this congregation. Let me show you one more thing before we move on from this. One more phrase in verse 12, going back to verse 12. Paul says once again, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. That's an odd wording. Why didn't Paul say, so it is with the church? Or, or why didn't he even say, so it is with the body of Christ? He doesn't say that. He says, as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. Paul's not describing the human body of Jesus. Rather, he is attributing the name of Jesus to his church. Think about that. Paul is saying that when the church comes together, it not only is the body of Christ, but in a very, very real sense, it represents Jesus Christ. As a congregation, we are so connected with Jesus that we bear his name. How awesome is that? How much of a responsibility is that as a congregation? We are Christ here at the corner of 441 and Taft. We represent we are the body of Christ to our community. So the first thing Paul says is this, as believers, we are all united in one body. There's a second truth that he pulls out. Notice verse 13 as we continue walking through this. Paul says in verse 13, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. What is it that Paul's talking about? The second thing, if you have your outline, is this. As believers, we are all baptized into one spirit. So as believers, we're not, all, we're not just all united in one body. But he's saying every single believer has been baptized into one spirit. There's some confusion as to the meaning of this verse. And so let me just kind of flesh it out and clarify for just a moment. So Paul is speaking of baptism in the Spirit in this passage, and he's not speaking of baptism by immersion here. Now, now, having said all of that, let me pause and say water baptism is important. It's extremely important. Just as we talked about last week, that you become a member of the Big C Church by the baptism in the Spirit, we believe that you become a, a part of the Little C Church by baptism by immersion. Here at Hollywood Community Church, we refer to baptism as the first step in the believer's walk. It is an act of obedience. And let me say, in the strongest terms that I possibly can today, with all the love that I can muster, if you're here today and you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but you haven't been baptized by immersion, you should be. You say, Brian, why is that? Because it's commanded in Matthew chapter 28. And you're following the example of Jesus Christ. Let me just put in a plug. Next Sunday, we're baptizing. <laughs> How does that work? That just happens to happen, huh? 
No, seriously, man, if you're here today and you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, you say, Brian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus. I've repented of my sin. I want to serve him. Man, follow the Lord in believer's baptism. There's a sign-up sheet in back. Monica has it back there. Get on our website and write Brian, write Brad, and say, listen, I'm a follower of Christ. I've never been baptized. I want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We want to celebrate that with you. That's incredibly important. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is not speaking of water baptism. The baptism that Paul is speaking about here is baptism in the Spirit. So if you have your outline, here's the way I said it. The baptism in the Spirit places each believer in the body of Christ. So, 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 so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been baptized in the Spirit. Because if you haven't been baptized in the Spirit, you are not a part of the body of Christ. Let me pause for a second and, and kind of talk about that for just a second. If you know anything about the church of Corinth, to whom Paul wrote this letter, the church of Corinth was not the most sanctified bunch. <laughs> church of Corinth had a lot of problems. They were bickering. They were fighting with each other. Some of them were saying, hey, we follow Paul. And others were saying, no, we follow Apollos. And others were saying, what are you doing following Paul and Apollos? We follow Jesus. And within the congregation, there was all of this division. There was sin that was taking place in the church of Corinth. And yet notice the terminology that Paul says, in spite of their imperfections, he addresses them and he says what? You have been baptized in the Spirit. For in one Spirit we were, what's the next word that's there? All baptized. Paul doesn't say, man, there's some of you here that have been baptized in the Spirit, but some of you haven't been baptized in the Spirit. Paul says, no, we've all been baptized in the Spirit. In spite of their cliquishness, in spite of their carnality, in spite of their corruption, Paul says, in spite of their faults, they were all baptized in the Spirit. You say, Brian, when did that take place? It took place at the moment of salvation. The moment when they repented of their sins and they, by faith, turned to Jesus Christ and placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. At that moment, there's a series of events that take place. We are, we are justified just as if we had never, ever sinned. We are, we, we are regenerated. God takes the old and makes it new. And, and we are baptized into the Spirit. At that moment, we are given the Holy Spirit of God. Paul addresses it this way in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. He says, you, however, talking to the Romans, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And he says, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, notice what he says, does not belong to him. So you might sit back today and say, man, Brian, <laughs> do I have the Holy Spirit of God living within me? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you do. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit of God living within you, you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. I would remind you that the topic that Paul is addressing is not individuality, but it's unity. That's what Paul is trying to accomplish. His main point is that baptism with one spirit makes the church one. And so even though there's diversity, he talks in the past, even though you're Jews, even though you're Greeks, even though you come from different nationalities, even though some of you are slaves, within the church of Corinth there were slaves and there were free. There were people who, man, had all the freedom they want and, and, and people who were slaves. Paul said it doesn't matter what your social status is, it doesn't matter what your nationality is, it doesn't matter what your economic status is, if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And here's the kicker, that makes us all one. We're all the same in Jesus Christ. 
What unifies us here at Hollywood Community Church is the same thing that unified the Church of Corinth. What unifies us together is not that we think alike, act alike, sing alike, dance alike, whatever. What unifies us is the same Holy Spirit of God who lives within each and every one of us today. The Holy Spirit that lives within me is the Holy Spirit who lives within you. We are unified by the Holy Spirit. There are no first-class Christians and second-class Christians. All of us are one. All of us have the same Holy Spirit. You have all of the Holy Spirit living within you. So, so here, the question today is not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have Here's the question, and allow this to sink into your mind and heart. The question is not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have, but how much of you does he have? In other words, how submitted are you and I to the Holy Spirit of God? Do you recognize his presence in your life? Well, that's such, I'm starting in my morning devotions as, as I get up and I spend time with the Lord. Lots of times I've always prayed to the Father through the Son. That's kind of the way we were taught to pray. But I'm starting to realize, man, there's a member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that I don't address on a regular basis. And I've started in my prayer time, even this morning, as I'm sitting in my room alone with God, to sit back and say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are here with me. You're indwelling me. I recognize your presence in my life today. And today I submit myself to you. Paul says all of us, all of us have been baptized into one spirit. There's a third truth that Paul lays out that I want us to see. And the third is this. As believers, we are all important to the body of Christ. This is actually the point that Paul's laying out in the passage. You are important to the body of Christ. Look at yourself and say, I am important to the body of Christ. Well, you're not too excited about doing that, are you, huh? You sit back and say, I don't want to talk to myself. People are going to think I'm crazy around me, all right? You are important to the body of Christ. As believers, I'm convinced that many of us don't understand that principle. We would sit back and some would say erroneously, why Pastor Brian is important to Hollywood Community Church, or Pastor Brad is important to Hollywood Community Church, or this person is important to Hollywood Community Church for what they do. But here's what I want you to catch. Every single one of us are important to the body of Christ. And no one of us is any more important than any one Do we have different functions? Yes, we have different functions. But all of us are equally a part of the body. And for us to not recognize that causes not only misconceptions in our life, but it causes erroneous actions and it causes erroneous responses. Notice with me, let's walk through just a couple of these verses quickly. Notice in verse 14, for Paul says, For the body does not consist of one member, but many members. We understand that. Verse 15, If the foot should say, Because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. What is he saying? There's no jealousy between body parts. Your hand isn't sitting back saying, man, I wish I was a foot. I wish I was a foot. Or your eye is not sitting back saying, man, I wish I was an ear. No, there's no jealousy. Why? Because every body part is important. And every body part has its function. Could you imagine, and I alluded to this, could you imagine if we were all the eye And there was just this great big eye. Anybody ever watch Monsters, Inc.? You know, the great big eye right there? Uh, I mean, that's abnormal. It's absolutely abnormal. That's what Paul is saying. Thank God we're not all eyes. Thank God we're not all ears. Thank God we're not all hands. Thank God we're not all this. We're different. Notice, let me keep reading in 
in verse uh, 17, Paul says this, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Paul goes on, I'm not going to read the rest of the passage, you can read the rest of the passage, he talks about the fact that, yes, there's some parts that are more honorable than others, there are some parts that seem more necessary than others, there's some parts that we're ashamed of and so we cover, and there's other parts that we're not ashamed of so we don't cover, he goes through and fleshes all of that out, you can read those verses and and see exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. But other than giving us a great description of the body, what is Paul trying to tell the church of Corinth? And what is he trying to tell us? Catch this. This is the most important thing maybe that I'm going to say today, okay? Catch this. It's in your outline. We are not independent of one another, but we are to be interdependent upon one another. Do you catch that? Is that deep? Let that sink in. We're not independent of one another. We can't survive if we're independent of one another. We're not independent of one another. We are interdependent upon one another. And Paul was dealing with that here because in Corinth there were a few prominent and gifted members who acted as if they were self-sufficient and acted as if they could live their daily lives on their own. In other words, they didn't need the church. They could function on their own without the body of Christ. In other words, they overestimated their importance and they underestimated the importance of others. I wrote down how sad. You see, here's what happens. Let me try to get practical today. When you view yourself as non-essential to the body of Christ, you might come in here on a regular basis and you might say, why, man, I'm certainly not one of the most important people here at Hollywood Community Church. Why? I'm not sure Brian even knows my name. I'm not that connected. I'm just a person that sits in this section. I'm not really essential. When you view yourself as non-essential, when you view yourself as not fitting, when you view yourself as not having a purpose, here's what you do. You disconnect. Because you don't see your purpose. And you disconnect and say, why, there's no function there, there's no purpose, there's no reason for me to be there. I can miss, and no one misses me. Here's what you are missing. You are missing your identity in Jesus Christ as a part of his body, and you are missing your importance to the body. This is so practical. What if, and I know we're talking about a lot of what ifs today, but what if my hand told me today, I woke up this morning, and when I woke up, my hand is looking right at me. And I'm like, oh my word, what do you want? And and my hand said, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I don't want to be a part of the body anymore. I think I can do this on my own. I'm out of here. Cut me off, and I can make it on my own. All right, I know that's crazy, all right? So what would happen if I said, okay, you're going to get exactly what you want, and I cut my hand off, all right? Now, now I would be an unbelievable plane. I get all of that from an anatomical part of you. But what would happen to the hand? Would the hand just kind of race off in the distance and be as happy as ever after and function as it was always intended to function? Is that what would happen to the hand? What would happen to the hand? It would wither up and die. It doesn't matter how independent it thought it was. It doesn't matter how much it thought it could make it on its own, that it didn't need the body, it could function on its own. On its own, the hand would what? Die. Because here's what the hand needs, the heart. The The hand needs the brain. The hand needs all of the neurons and all of the things that are connected with it. The hand can't survive on its own. 
The hand cannot be independent. Why? It was never created to be independent. Do you get it today? That's what Paul is saying. You weren't created to be independent. Yeah, but Brian, you don't understand. I can read my Bible during the week and I'm fine. You weren't created to be that way. Hey, Brian, I can watch preachers on the internet and quite frankly, Brian, a lot of them are a better preacher than you. You weren't created to do that. You were created to be a part of the body. And apart from the body, you cannot survive. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in the passage. You, not only is the body important to you for functioning, but you are important to the body. Here's what I want you to get, church. Don't minimize your role. Don't minimize your role. Whatever you do, don't minimize your role. You are important to the body of Christ. Hey, do me a favor. Look at the person beside you and tell them, you are important to the body of Christ. Would you do that for me? Now look at the person to the other side of you. Most of you looked at your spouse, all right? Look at the person to the other side of you and say, you are important to the body of Christ. Listen, church, we need each other. You can't make it without me. And I can't make it without you. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. It doesn't matter how much of the Bible you have memorized. It doesn't matter whether you can say all 66 books forward and then you can say it backwards as well. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church and you have all the Sunday school pins that are down because you never missed. And you sit back and say, Brian, I've got this. I can do it on my own. Here's what Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You can't. Because you were never intended to live that way. You were created to be a part of the body. Don't feel like you can disconnect. Don't feel like no one will be affected. That is not true. We need you. And you need us. And what happens when we disconnect? The body is affected. Not only are you affected, but the body is affected. You might say, Brian, how do we demonstrate, how do we display that independence? Let me give you just a couple of ways. We, we display that independence by not worshiping with our church family. We display that independence by not using our talents and our gifts within the body. Remember how I said a few moments ago that, that this is the complete body of Christ? So as I look out at you today, here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at hands, and I'm looking at feet, and I'm looking at ears, and I'm looking at, at toes, and I'm looking at everything. You are the body of Christ, and we need you. Ron Meyer, we were talking about this. Is Ron in here right now? I'm not sure. Yeah, Ron is here. Ron said, Brian, what part am I? And David and I were joking that we think Ron is the ingrown toenail. That's the part that, <laughs> that, that, that he is to the body or the hangnail or something like that. Hey, he set himself up for that. That wasn't us. He set himself up for that. Listen, when, when you don't use the gifts and the talents that God has given to you, who hurts? The church hurts. You were created. You were gifted. You were given the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, we'll teach on this one of these days. The moment that you receive the Holy Spirit of God, you were given spiritual gifts for the purpose of using that within the body. And for you to sit back and say, I have those gifts, but I'm not going to use them, is not only selfish, because it not only hurts you, but it hurts the body as well. By not using our gifts and our talents, by not sharing burdens with others, we're going to see that in just a moment, and I'm not going to go too long. By not praying and caring for one another. Listen, here's what Paul is saying. We are not independent. Or in, yeah, excuse me. We are not independent of one another. We are interdependent upon one another. And the more we realize that, the more it helps us. Let me show you one last thing. Verses 25 and verse 26. Jump down there. Notice what Paul says. He says, the reason for all of this, here's what he says, the reason for all of this is so that there might not be any division in the body, but that the members 
might have the same care for one another. I love this. If one member suffers, what does he say? All suffer together. If one member is honored or, or rejoices, all rejoice together. Here's what I put in my outline, really simple. We suffer together and we rejoice together. As a church, we suffer together and rejoice together. I told you, I know my time's getting away, so I, I told last week that on New Year's Eve I fell. I actually fell and hurt myself pretty good. I realize I'm not young, so I'll tell you the story really quick. So Vicki was out of town. Can you believe my wife abandoned me on New Year's Eve? I can't imagine that. That's a whole different topic. So Vicki was out of town up in Wisconsin. I have Amber. I'm taking care of Amber. And so just a, a weird scenario of events. When I put Amber to bed, we have this vaporizer thing that's always working to keep her lungs clear. And, and when I put her to bed, it was leaking and water was pouring down the wall and I was worried about it. So I disconnected it and I'm worried about water going into the receptacle. And so I disconnect it and I dry off the wall and I think everything's good. So I told you it's New Year's Eve. I went to bed. I went to bed about 1030. So I, I can't sleep in the same room with Amber, so I was asleep on the couch in the living room, sound asleep, went to sleep with, with clothes on and socks on, which I normally don't do. At 11.58, one of my neighbors, one of my loving neighbors, decides right outside the door of our house to let off fireworks. And so at 11.58, I am in a sound sleep. I'm dreaming of Vicky and how much I miss her and... You know, all of that. And at 11.58, I hear, pop, 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 And I'm in the sound sleep, and I wake up, and I'm seeing sparks in everything that fly. I mean, from the fireworks out in the street. The first thing I think of, I don't even know that it's New Year's Eve. I don't know anything. I wake up, and I think I just had this vaporizer that was leaking all over the wall. And I was worried about it hitting a receptacle. In my mind, the first thing I think was, Amber's bed is on fire. So I hop up and hit. So we got a piece of carpet there. Right beside the carpet is this tile. I hit that thing so quick, and I hit that tile. And when my left foot hit that tile with socks on, I flipped way up in the air and came down on my hip. Bruised my hip really bad. We got pictures of it. We can show you, right, Vicky? No, we're not, no, we're not going to show. <laughs> I'm not going to show. I sent Vicky a picture of it, and she's like, I can't believe you sent me this picture. She deleted it from her phone right away. <laughs> so, so I got up, and at that moment, not only did my hip hurt, but, but I start hopping around at that moment. So, so without thinking about it, my right leg compensates for my left leg at that moment. Don't even have to say, come on, do your business. It just normally does it. And I'm telling you, I'm in pain, and, and like tears start to fall from my eyes. I mean, I didn't have to tell my tear ducts work. My tear ducts automatically started working at that moment. At that moment, all of my body came to the help of my left hip that was right there. And it was like all the rest of my body were saying, we're here for you. We're here for you. And I, hey, this left hip would have never survived if it wasn't for the rest of the body. And I'm telling you, all week long, Vicky knows, I'm like the whiniest, wimpiest guy. I've been saying, oh my word, my whole body hurts. And she's like, Brian, because I'm holding this side, and she's saying, you fell on your left side. You didn't fall on your right side. Quit. But I'm like, yeah, but my right side hurts too. And so what happens? The whole, I mean, when I fell, not only did this part of my body suffer, but all of my body suffered. God allowed that to happen so I could tell you that story for sure. <laughs> Here's what Paul says. When one member suffers, we all. Hey, can I say this? In order for you to suffer with the members, you know what you got to know? You got to know the people around you. You got to know what the person to your right is going through and what the person to your left is going through. And you got to be part connected. If you're not part of a life group, you need to be part of a life group, a group of people that do things together. Why? So that you can function together as a body. 
Paul says, when one suffers, we all suffer. And if we're not careful, we show indifference, we show independence by not caring how the rest of the body suffers or how the rest of the body rejoices. You ever take a cold drink of water on a warm day? Not only do your lips get the refreshment, but that, the, but that cool water, what, soaks into your whole body. And scientists talk, we can talk about how all of that affects the entire body. Hey, here's what Paul says, I'm done. We're all united in one body. We are all baptized by one spirit. We are all important. You are important to the body. God placed you here in his sovereignty. He brought you to Hollywood Community Church. Here's why he brought you to Hollywood. You might have came for a variety of reasons. You might have came because we have great children's ministry. You might have came for whatever reason. But God brought you here because he knows we need you. And you need So here's my question, and I'm done. Are you a functioning part of the body? Are you functioning? Are you just an arm that's there? Can't do anything. It's connected, but it can't do anything. Doesn't do anything, because it doesn't realize what its function is. Do you have a function? This is what that's exactly what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He's talking about until we recognize our unity, who we are in Christ, and how important we are to one another, we'll never be, we'll never become, we'll never fulfill what God wants us to be. You are the body of Christ. Let's represent Jesus Christ here in Hollywood. Would you stand with me today? Stand with me, please, as Jonas and the team come. Man, if you're here today, let me say this. If you're here today, two or three things. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm not saying do you attend church on a regular basis even though you should. I'm not saying have you ever read your Bible even though we think you should. I'm not saying do you give. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm saying has there been a moment in your life when you've recognized that you need Jesus Christ and you have repented of your sins and you by faith have turned to Jesus Christ there's never been a moment that that's happened in your life. Can we help you? We're going to have elders and leaders down front that would not, love nothing more than to take the word of God and show you how you can know for sure you're a part of the body. Have you been baptized? If you haven't been, can I encourage you to take that step? I would encourage you. We'd love to pray with you about that. Are you functioning? You sit back and say, okay, Brian, man, I, I want to find my place. Can we help you find your place? We would love to help you do that. It all starts, though, with you. It starts with you saying, okay, God, I realize I'm a part of the body. I'm valuable. God, I want to function as a part of the body. Let us help you and encourage you. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for the truth of the word of God. Lord, what an awesome thought to realize that Jesus is here present with us today. We're not just singing about him, we're singing with him today. As a body, we're so important to him that he has chosen to be with us. And we honor him today. I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here today who has never, never by faith given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that they would make that decision. Either where they're sitting or or they would come up and grab my hand or one of our leader's hands and, and make that decision for Christ. There's those here today that have never followed you in believer's baptism. Give them the courage to take that step. And for those of us who aren't functioning in the body, we're, we're a dormant member of the body. Help us to realize how important we are, how usable we are. And I pray that you would use us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.